and a fine good morning to you this weekend before Christmas. Russ Barkley again, dressed up as uh, Santa Claus or an elf, whatever you prefer. Uh, this week we've only got three articles to talk about, but for Christmas my son gave me a gift of Christmas dad jokes. So I'm going to subject you to these uh, apologies uh, if they are painful, but I thought some of these were kind of funny. So here you go. What do you call Santa when he's run out of cash? Saint Nicholas. <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. All right. Another one. How do you scare a snowman? Just grab a hairdryer. <laughs> That's not really Christmassy. It's more wintertime, I think. So why did the turkey join the rock band? Because he had drumsticks. What else is he going to play? Okay, last one up and then we'll stop the pain. Why does Santa always enter a home through the chimney? Probably because it suits him. That's S-O-O-T-S, by the way, for those of you phonetically challenged. All right, that's your dad jokes for this week before Christmas. Hope you enjoyed them. The audience around here sure did. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Okay, let's get to our three research articles. By the way, there were more than 25 published this week, but most of them were either dissertations or not reviewed by journals uh, or really of no, um, no noteworthiness to talk about. So uh, that being said, let's take a look at an article that actually several people wrote me about. And it also made it into the trade media. This is a very large review on the effectiveness of pharmacological, psychological, and neurostimulatory interventions for ADHD in adults. I want to emphasize that. This is only a review of treatments for adult ADHD. They took a look at not only the pharmacological interventions, but they also looked at cognitive behavioral therapy as well as dialectic behavior therapy, and they also looked at neurostimulatory interventions, including neurofeedback as well as other forms of neural stimulation, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation. So they pulled together lots and lots of research papers and wound up with 113 studies that involved randomized controlled trials with comparisons against placebos in the case of medicine or against alternative therapies in the case of psychological therapies or other control conditions such as information control conditions. That's very important because there's a lot of studies out there that compare treatments to no treatment. And although those are informative, the biggest problem with them is that they don't control for the act of participating in the treatment itself, which is time with therapists, attention from clinicians and others who might be doing the evaluations and the treatment. So there's a lot of general nonspecific demands, if you will, or effects that occur within a research project that the no treatment control group doesn't really get exposed to, including the time spent with the people doing the intervention. That alone can result in improvements in people regardless of what treatment it is that you're testing. So uh, the, while there are these many studies that used weightless control groups, this article did not include those because of not just the uh, factors that I've already mentioned about demand characteristics and time and attention, uh, but also the fact that the individuals that were in the study did not necessarily or were not necessarily blinded to the intervention that was taking place. So uh, all that being said, let's just concentrate then on what they found for these randomized controlled trials that used appropriate control groups. They found that of the 113 unique randomized controlled trials, only those studies that examined stimulants and the non-stimulant atomoxetine showed effectiveness in comparison to the placebo or control group on both measures of 
self-reported ADHD symptoms and on clinician rated ADHD symptoms. Now, they found for the other interventions, the non-pharmacological interventions, that the treatments were not better than placebo on the self-ratings of ADHD symptoms. But they did find improvement in clinician-rated symptoms for cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive remediation, and psychoeducation, as well as, to some extent, mindfulness interventions. But those were only on clinician ratings, not on patient self-reports. Overall, the study concludes that when we're looking at the outcomes of treatment, the medication treatments, specifically the stimulants and atomoxetine, have the greatest evidence for their effectiveness. Now, I don't think that surprises you, right? because we've talked about that before on this channel, that the largest effects of intervention and the most reliable effects of intervention have been found with the medications. Now, I do want to point out that there are a couple of limitations to the review. First of all, the review does not, as I've said, look at comparisons to no treatment or weightless control groups. And there are plenty of studies that show, particularly for the psychological interventions, that they're better than doing nothing. But as I said, the more rigorous studies focus on having an active intervention or a placebo. The second thing is that sometimes when researchers do a meta-analysis of just one treatment, like cognitive behavior therapy for adult ADHD, they are able to get access to more studies than might have been available for this particular review. And that's usually because they approach the investigators and get their data from them. Whereas in this review, the studies were simply pulled from the literature and the authors went through the papers and pulled out the information they needed from the table of results. So sometimes you can get, I think, better evidence for effectiveness of some interventions when you are able to get access to the data sets from those studies. Okay, that said, to remind you, just to reiterate, this, this review found that medication was the most effective when it came to both self-ratings of ADHD and clinician-rated ADHD. Okay, next up, and by the way, that paper appeared over in The Lancet Psychiatry this week. Next up is a review that was published earlier this year. I didn't have a chance to talk about it. It was back in August. It was published over in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Re Reviews, and it's not really a study. It's a review of treatments that are in the pipeline for ADHD in adults. So this is different than the first review I just talked about. Here they're looking at what kinds of interventions are out there being studied that have not yet been FDA approved in the case of medications or have not yet become acceptable evidence-based treatments if they are psychological interventions. And this review goes through a variety of new medications that are being tried out there, and they required that not only should there be a study that found effectiveness on ADHD symptoms in adults, but that it have been replicated at least once. And of all of the different medications that were being tried, they found only one that appeared to be useful and was replicated. And that is the drug sentinaphidine. This drug, like Welbutrin or other drugs, happens to have an effect on several different brain neurotransmitters rather than being specific to, say, dopamine, or in the case of atomoxetine, being more specific to norepinephrine. This drug actually affects different neurotransmitters, dopamine, norp norepinephrine, and to some extent, probably serotonin. So it's an interesting drug to keep an eye on out there. It's not yet approved for use with adults with ADHD, but it looks promising. They reviewed a variety of other medications, and either the medication was not effective, or only one study had been done and it hadn't yet been replicated. 
So very important paper there I thought that you might want to hear about. And by the way, they did look at non-medical interventions, such as games for ADHD adults to play, cognitive training, such as forms of cognitive behavior therapy that were being uh, tested out to see if they could be improved in some way over the existing cognitive behavior therapies, and so on. Uh, but as yet, they don't have enough evidence for their effectiveness. All right, last up is a study on what predicts the occupational outcomes of adults with ADHD. And specifically, they're going to look at the role of the two types of symptoms, inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity, but they're also going to look at the effects of executive functioning deficits on certain occupational outcomes. Now, this study was published over in the Journal of Occupational Rehabilitation, uh, and it was done up at Rutgers University uh, and involved my friend Josh Langberg, who used to work here in Richmond at Virginia Commonwealth University. So this study looked at 100 adults with ADHD who were working full-time. The subjects were between 19 and 30 years of age, and they had the individuals rate not only their ADHD symptoms, but their difficulties with executive functioning, on my rating scale, by the way, and that looks at time management, self-organization, self-restraint, which is impulse control, uh, also looks at emotion regulation uh, and self-motivation, among others. So this is an interesting paper that looks at how each of those might predict occupational functioning. Now, what did they look at for occupational functioning? They looked at the level of income the person was getting. They looked at whether they had received written warnings from their employer, uh, whether the individuals reported being uh, significantly bored at work, uh, whether they were satisfied with their coworkers or their supervisors. Notice they didn't get ratings from the coworkers or supervisors over whether they were satisfied with these people, but that of course would require uh, getting consent to contact employers, and a lot of people are reluctant to give that kind of consent. In any case, let's jump down here to the results, and they show that after controlling for medication status, sex, and age, they found that the hyperactive impulsive symptoms along with time management, were the best predictors of the outcomes in the study. So those are probably the two best. But in addition to that, um, they did find that executive functioning difficulties, particularly problems with organization, motivation, and time management, were related to certain other outcomes. And finally, they found that the higher the level of inattention symptoms the more those were likely to be associated with greater written warnings from their employers and a lower satisfaction with their coworkers. So overall, we can see that not only do the ADHD symptom dimensions predict certain outcomes at work, but especially problems with executive functioning are likely to do so and do so in more domains of functioning than is seen, say, with ADHD, inattention, or hyperactivity. Okay, so that's it for this week, everybody. I hope you enjoyed these few research studies, and I hope you have a good holiday week coming up as well. I'll see you next week with more commentaries and, of course, another research review uh, the following weekend. And until then, uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to everybody if you're celebrating that holiday. Uh, otherwise, happy winter solstice to you all. Uh, and as always, live well, be well, and take care. Bye for now.